Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy and chapter number 2. We're now in our last several messages dealing with how we got our authorized version, how we got our English Bible, and to be able to trace through the history. Now, of course, today is where we were headed towards dealing with the idea of the translation of the authorized version, and we want to see how this was put together, but of course, we always want to start with Scripture. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 2. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 2, and if you wouldn't mind, notice with me in verse number 15. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and in verse number 15, the word of God says this, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you haven't already, we would encourage you, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, mark a phrase that we find in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Study to show thyself approved unto God. And with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you now, I'm asking that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us discernment, that you would help us to have a clear vision of history, that it would be forthright, it would be honest, that it would be a help, and that we would have a better understanding of the process that you use to give us the Word of God in our own language, and we're thankful for it. I'm asking that you would open our eyes that we may see, that we could see, um, discern these things, for me personally, Lord, I know that my voice is going. I'm asking that you would give much grace to allow it to last through the message and that it could be <clears throat> what it needs to be to get across this information. Lord, I'm very dependent upon you now. Fill me with your spirit the best I know how I reckon myself dead and ask that you set these things in order. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, of course, taking the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, just taking that one verse can take an entire message because it's so rich and so necessary. It says to study to show thyself approved unto God. Notice the person that we're supposed to be approved unto. It's not to your pastor. It's not to your folks. It's not to... Um, to uh, organization, not to denomination. It's to be approved unto God. And that we need to study to show ourselves approved unto Him. Notice what else it says. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman. I know that study is a four-letter word. It's work. It's one of the reasons why people don't like to study is because it is work. And notice as it goes on, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. There's one thing about getting work done, but doing it in a way that later on you're ashamed of it. Let's say that you're building a wall and then you end up doing an awful job and it falls over the first time a fox lands on it. Nehemiah, if you want to reference that. Uh, <laughs> You want to be able to do the work and put the work into it that you're going to be able to say, this was right. It wasn't proven wrong. It wasn't faulty. I didn't believe a false thing the whole time. Then notice what it says. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now implied in here, if there is a right way to divide the word of truth, that means there's a wrong way to divide the word of truth. Now this is a big deal because you could take the word of God and divide it wrongly, interpret wrongly, discern it wrongly, and it could lead you down a wrong path. This is one of the whole reasons why this is so important because our Bible is our central. It is central to everything that we believe and everything that we do. And we need to have it rightly divided. Now notice that the authorized version says to study to show thyself approved. Well, it doesn't say that 
in the different versions. For example, in the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Notice, there's no study in that verse. Well, maybe it's an oversight. Let's see what the NIV has to say. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker that needeth. There's no study. Okay, well, well, let's see another one. How about the new King James? We haven't touched that yet. New King James, be diligent to present yourself approved unto God. Well, that's a big deal. Do you know that none of the modern versions, except for the authorized version, commands you to study? That's a big deal. Only the authorized version commands us to study. None of the modern versions, except for the authorized versions, gives this commandment. That is very interesting indeed. <laughs> well, if we can't study to show ourselves approved unto God, knowing that study is work, does it mean that if we don't study, we're not going to rightly divide the word of truth? We understand this is a big deal. That if you don't study your Bible and you don't rightly discern from your Bible, you're going to be missing out on things that God wants you to have. And you're not going to divide the word of truth. And then one day you're going to have to stand before God and give an account. This is a big deal. Remember, the one that we're getting approved by is by God. Not man, not by anyone else. So I want to make sure that I could rightly discern the word of God. Rightly divide it and it comes by study. And work. So I could stand before God and not be ashamed. At least the things that are based off of the word of God. The Bible commands us to study. While everyone else is just commanded to do good and work hard. Not studying work. But just work hard. Be good. Well that's a big deal. That's kind of opposite of exactly what the verse is trying to get across. Now that's just introduction. Let's start gearing into back to history. All right, so as we left off, we had <laughs> the different Bibles that had been given to us in our English language, but there was still a division. Now we come up to Queen Elizabeth. Remember, Queen Elizabeth is going to be the daughter of Henry VIII. She came to the throne of England in 1558. From the reign of Henry VIII, her father, the English Reformation had been both religious and political in character. Remember that he didn't uh, break away from the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, he was called the defender of the faith by the Pope at one time. He didn't break away from the Roman Catholic Church because of doctrine. He did it because he wanted a divorce and the Pope told him no. And so I'm going to go do my own thing. And so the English Reformation had always been a political thing. And so people were trying to control how the English um, Reformation was going to turn. Which way? They were going to control the flavor of it. That's, that's something you have to know that it's not based off of doctrine. <clears throat> now during Queen Elizabeth's reign, three parties vied for control of the church and state. The Papist, which would be the Catholics, the Episcopalians, which is the Church of England, and the Puritans. And all three of them squabbled and fought and did everything they could to get control of the English church and the direction of English Christianity. Now, during the reign of Elizabeth I, the power of the Catholic party was broken by two events. So during this time, this is an important time of history, the Catholic church is going to lose its power in England through two different ways. First of all, the first event was the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary Stuart was a cousin of Elizabeth, and since Elizabeth was childless, she was the heir of the English throne. So if Queen Elizabeth died, then what would happen? Mary, Queen of Scots, would take over to be um, queen. Now, she was a Scottish queen, so she wasn't English, she was Scottish, and she was a strong Roman Catholic. The problem is, is that her country, under John Knox, had become very much Protestant, specifically Presbyterian. John Knox was a hard preacher. Queen uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, you should always learn quotes from folks. Mary, Queen, Queen of Scots, said that she feared John Knox's preaching more than all of the armies of England. She was scared to death. If you could ever get some history and read between the rivalry between John Knox and Queen uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, it was a big deal. Well, because of the preaching of John Knox, all of Scotland had become um, Presbyterian and not Catholic. Well, because of that, the Scottish people didn't want a Catholic queen, so they pretty much deposed her. 
1567, Mary was forced to abdicate the throne of Scotland and her infant son James was made king of Scotland. Mary fled to England because she didn't want to die and she sought military aid from Elizabeth. So she was hoping to go to her cousin and say, Elizabeth, hey, they overthrew me in Scotland. Can you lend me some troops and I'll go back and take it over? Well, instead, because of the um, <coughs> anti-Catholic views of many of the English people, she ended up just being arrested and put into prison. Now, it wasn't like a hard prison. It was more a house arrest. But this is going to come back and kind of plague Elizabeth for a long time. Because for 19 years, Mary, Queen of Scots, plotted against uh, her cousin uh, Elizabeth and the English throne over and over. She tried to beg uh, the Catholics to come and send armies. She was waiting for assassins to come and kill Elizabeth. Remember, she is the next queen of England. So if she could get someone to kill her cousin, then she's in charge. She could get out and then take over Scotland again. Finally, she was executed in 1587. And when that happened, a powerful Catholic threat to England was removed. By the way, Elizabeth tried to do everything she could not to kill her cousin. But because of plot after plot after plot, she had no choice. And in order to just settle the people she, and to save her own life, she had to put to death her own cousin. But when she did that, it ended the last uh, Catholic threat inside of the British Isles. Now, the second event that kind of broke the Catholic domination was Sir Francis Drake. Now, Drake got a hold of Fox's Book of Martyrs and he read it. By the way, for the longest time, uh, Christian schools and Christian kids were taught to read the Bible and they had two other textbooks along with them. John Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress and Fox's Book of Martyrs. And you should, get, every Christian should read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Bring tissues with you because it's going to give tale after tale of people who lost their life to give you the word of God, who died for the cause of individual soul freedom, who made a stand against the established Catholic Church. And through the records of Fox's Book of Martyrs and Martyrs Mirrors and such books that they they um, gave 50 million people who died under the hands of, <clears throat> of the Catholics and then later on the Reformers for the cause of Christ. A very big deal. Well, when Drake read this and saw all the deaths that the Catholics were responsible for, it fired him up. He said, I'm going to do something about it. So what he did is he bought some ships. Then he sailed the seven seas looking for Roman Catholic treasure ships. Now for those of you who are trying to place history together, this is the time when the Spanish are now controlling the new world. And they have went ahead and plundered all the riches of Mexico and plundered the riches of South America. And they're taking all the gold and putting them on their Spanish galleons and sailing them back to Spain who by the way answered to the Roman Catholic Church. Well, Francis Drake said, not on my watch. And so he went to go find every single Spanish galleon he could and sunk them down to the bottom of the ocean. Now, the problem was, is the Catholics were using this to finance all of their projects to help take over the world. And when they lost the money, well, that lost some of that power they had too. So he would track down the boats and sink them for the glory of God. Then Sir Francis Drake just about bankrupted the Catholic Church because now they were overextended on their money and all their money is now in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. So without the treasures, the Catholics ran out of money. They couldn't keep sending armies to take over the countries. They couldn't keep buying off spies and political leaders to help controlling governments, which, by the way, was a very real thing back in that age. Mary, Queen of Scots, had left England to, to Philip II of Spain in her will. So when she died, she goes, I give my husband, Philip II of Spain, all of England. And so Philip II... Uh, she was hoping that Philip II will say now that I own England according to her will that he would take all of his ships and go ahead and sail them to England take it over. Now at this time the Spanish were the king of the seas. They had what was called the Spanish Armada. The invincible fleet. So Spain was the great power 
And in 1588, Philip sent the Spanish Armada a fleet of 136 heavenly armed galleons and other ships of war to go invade England. The English Navy was led by Sir Francis Drake. Might as well get the guy who's used to seeking him. And so they put him in charge. And so he gathered up the English fleet of about 30 ships. So it's going to be 136 ships of war versus Sir Francis Drake and 30 English ships. Well, what happened? <clears throat> well, the Spanish Armada at this time was called the Invincible Armada. No one could defeat our fleet. No one could defeat our ships. Nothing could happen. Well, then they made Sir Francis Drake and he just kicked their galleons. So the English Navy with their 30 ships destroyed the Spanish Armada and the rest of the ships fled. Well, God wasn't finished with them. And so as they sailed around England up through the northern part past Scotland, they ran into a bunch of storms. And God finished sinking the ships for Sir Francis Drake and destroyed the rest of the Spanish Armada. So God was on the side. One of those things in history where God once again was fighting. And we look through history and see what God was doing in helping protect them. It was amazing what God did. Now from this date, the Roman Catholic Church has never regained the power that they had. They left their money and now their fleet is gone. Now Luther had read, led a reformation that was fueled by Erasmus that ended up breaking the intellectual stranglehold of the Catholic Church inside of England. Then Drake broke their financial stronghold and now the Catholics don't have power in England anymore. England became the great military and seafaring nation of the world. The question whether England would be Catholic or Protestant had been settled, firmly established with a period and explanation mark. We're going to be Protestant. We're not going to be Catholic. Now as a result of Drake, not only did he effectively bankrupt the papacy, but now England was now the dominant power of the sea. And this is going to put some great benefits. So the English being in power of the sea would allow William Carey to sail to in India and it's become a missionary. It's going to allow Hudson Taylor to sail to China. It's going to allow Hudson Taylor, or, um, oh, Adamire Johnson to uh, head to Burma. And all, what's going to happen is that because England controls the seas and the merchants now were going to try to establish um, trade, these missionaries are going to have freedom to go evangelize the entire world and be able to tell people about the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now this brings us to King James. Of course Elizabeth dies. Mary Queen of Scots has already been executed. So the next one to sit on the throne would be King James. Now James was the only son or was the son of Mary Queen of Scots. He was proclaimed King James the sixth of Scotland as an infant. Now remember they kicked out his mom. He's a little baby. They put him in charge in 1567. He was raised by the Scottish nobility as a Protestant, not a Catholic. His effective reign began at 1583. You said, why is this his effective reign? Well, because as a baby he couldn't make decisions. Amen. He finally had to take charge. By the way, when you read the kingly list inside of the Bible, sometimes you'll see different dates. Part of that is because of the same reason. If you look anywhere where they have uh, uh, kings, you'll notice that there's that starting date and effective ruling date. And those are two different ruling dates. That happens from time to time because as a baby you can't make decisions. But finally when you become mature and you cast off all of those advisors, you're finally king. That's what happened. Now upon the death of Elizabeth, he became King James I of England, hereby uniting the two realms of Scotland and England for the very first time. Now, as a child, James had received instruction in several languages, and he himself was a student of the Bible. He personally translated the Psalms, that's a big work, and paraphrased in his own words uh, the book of Revelation. Now, this is just saying that he has an interest in the Bible. He's not going to touch our Bible, but this is just showing a little bit of his history on it. Now, upon sending the throne, King James was confronted with two religious parties. Now, remember, the Catholics are now kicked out, so you only have two left over. The Episcopalians, the Church of England, and the Puritans. Each one of them are trying to get uh, control of the English Reformation. 
Now, though he was raised in Presbyterian Scotland, James preferred the Episcopalian notion of the divine rights of kings. Now, at this time, this was a popular notion going out through England. If you may be familiar with Louis XIV of France, he became uh, James's hero. That under the divine right of kings, they said that God has appointed me and my descendants to become king. I am king not because you say so people. It's because God has ordained me. Which technically is true, but they're taking it too far. They believe that because God has put them as king, that whatever they say rules and whatever they say should go uh, happen no matter whether it's against the law or right or wrong and whatnot. Well, because James preferred that idea as he's looking at Louis XIV, he prefer, preferred the Episcopalians who leaned to be more Catholics than what he did the Puritans. Now, the reason why he despised the Geneva Bible was because the notes of the Geneva Bible were more Republican in nature, meaning that it was the personal responsibility of the people to rule and to, um, to make decisions and not just based off of what somebody said. So the, the Geneva Bible didn't favor a monarchy. So again, all the people loved the Geneva Bible partly because they didn't want the authority of the king and its misuses over time. Now this was a conflict between two religious parties and God is going to use this conflict to bring across the publication of the King James Bible. Now the Bishop's Bible was the official Bible of one party the Geneva Bible was the official party of another. And so each one of them fought, each one of them had their own different views, and each one of them could not meet in the middle because of their views. Sounds familiar, right? Having two different political parties and two different things and they just can't get their thinking to, to coincide. They can't even discuss it anymore. And so this is a big problem within England right now is that there's a, there's a big schism and there's no way of getting it fixed. Now, with this, King James did not give us the Bible. He did not write the Bible. But he is going to be the authority to help bring us the, the Word of God. Now, this Bible, by the way, wasn't even called the King James Version until 1929, which I've explained the story before. I'll go ahead and do it again. That for the next 300 years, it was only called the Authorized Version. And when the other versions of the Bible started to come out in the late 1800s, the Revised Standard Version, the American American Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, those companies who first published them went bankrupt because no one would buy them. Why would I buy a revised version when I can have the authorized version? So in 1929, they helped change and mark the marketing of it. The publishing companies changed it and said, now it's just a King James Version. So the rest of the Bibles would sell as well. Now, Another book that if you're interested in, it's, I think it's what God had wrought. And what it does is it traces every time that America has turned in their Bible and changed it for a different one, something else happened. What happened in 1929 when we started messing with the Bible? Start market crashed and the Great Depression. You say that's a coincidence. It's an interesting coincidence. And if it didn't keep happening, you'd almost think over and over. Every time someone messed with the Bible something happened. Just here and there, that's between you. But it's interesting, there's a couple of books that document that and watch, they change the Bible and watch what happens somewhere else. Neither here nor there, but that's for free. In 1603, the millinery petition was signed by about approximately a thousand Puritan pastors. So when King James comes to the throne, they give him this petition and say, King, could you please consider these requests? Now, why are these pastors writing to King James and writing this petition? Because according to the way that English church is set up, the Pope of the English church is the king. The king is the head. So right now we have Queen Elizabeth II. She is the head of the Church of England. If you didn't know that, that's how it works. She's the head. And so if you could imagine, not only is King James the king of, the, of England, he's also the head. He is the spiritual leader of all of the Church of England. So this is why the pastors had wrote to him. And they said, because you're the Church of England uh, head, could you consider making these changes? This is one of the reasons why we're thankful to be an independent church, that we don't have to answer and get permission. Here's the things that they were asking permission to do. The petition called on King James to allow certain changes in church services and judgment. 
For example, they wanted to eliminate the use of the sign of cross. If you're familiar with a Catholic background, they're very familiar doing this. They are not just, you know, <laughs> making a cross saying bless you, but they're making a sign of a cross. They said, King James, could you authorize that we could stop doing that here? We're not Catholic. But they had to ask permission for it to flow into the services. They also said, let's eliminate the priestly garments because, oh, that we like to wear our robes. And they're like, we don't need the robes. In order to go to church, we shouldn't have to wear these things. Could we, could we get permission to not wear these things? I'm glad that I don't have to any, ask anybody's permission of what to wear. Some of you say, well, you, you should at least ask your wife. You know, and <laughs> but, you know, we don't have to ask permission from some human government. We could try to find out what God would have us to do ourselves. Also to eliminate wedding rings. It's neither here nor there, but Puritans weren't big a big fan of wedding rings because of its Catholic origin. I'm not opposed to a wedding ring. My wife prefers me to wear a wedding ring, especially if I'm out and about. And just, you know, maybe branding, but that's what another thing that they had asked for. They had asked for a provision in biblical church polity or church government, which again, the um, Puritans would be more in favor for, the Episcopalians wouldn't. But they said, why do we have to have certain things set up this way when it's not biblical? Let's go back to the biblical thing. But they had to ask permission to go back to a biblical thing to see if King James would allow it. They also asked to provide for a ministry trained in the Bible. Hey, how about this? People who are in charge of making decisions about the Bible, can they at least be trained in the Bible? Maybe, hopefully. That'd be nice. They also asked for corrections on the corrupt quotations from the quote, uh, corrupt translations contained in the English book of Common Prayer. Now, the English Book of Common Prayer is a book that the uh, Episcopalians, the Church of England's, by the way, what are the Episcopalians known for, known as in America? Anybody know? Anglicans. So, an Anglican church is a Church of England church. Well, the Church of England had this book of common prayers that has many readings. They, the people would read from it. But it had a lot of mistakes because it was quoting from the wrong text. It was quoting from the corrupt text. Now, the practices of that uh, English uh, book of common prayer had been condoned by Elizabeth because she sought to appease her many Catholic subjects while forcing them to be part of the, the Church of England. So it was part of the trade. I know you're Catholic, but you're part of Church of England. But how about this? We'll allow you to have your own version used in the Church of uh, the Book of Common Prayer. And that was kind of the give me, take me. Well, now that the Catholics have lost a lot of their power, the Puritans said, can we just get rid of that corrupt text? Can we just put the good text in there and use that instead? This all leads to the Hampton Court Conference. Now, King James called the Hampton Court Conference. This meeting was proclaimed by the king to settle the religious differences within the kingdom. Remember, you have the two griping factions. And he says, I can't run a unified kingdom if everybody's at each other's throat. So what can we do to kind of make everyone happy? So they met at Hampton Court in London, England, in uh, January 14th of 1604. <clears throat> The members of this committee for this meeting were four Puritans chosen by the king. That's it. Nine bishops, nine preachers, and four professors from Cambridge and Oxford. These are the people who were invited. And this conference was stacked against the Puritans, so they couldn't possibly get their way on anything. James, again, was trying to make the Puritans lose out in all their arguments. Now, to be fair, King James made fun of everyone in this conference, but he was specifically hard on the Puritans. When they would bring up something, he would laugh and joke at them and, and be snide in his comments. Dr. John Reynolds was the main speaker on behalf of the beleaguered Puritans. The Puritans were defeated, as they said, by kingly insolence and pride. Meaning, the objections they tried to bring up, the king would just slap them down. And they just felt like, it's not going anywhere. We're trying to give honest requests, and he's not listening at all. Dr. John Reynolds also made one suggestion that caught the attention of the king. 
He said that we desire a translation to be made of the whole Bible as consistent as can be to the original Hebrew and Greek text. And this to be set out and printed without any marginal notes and only to be used in all the churches of England in times of divine service. So what is he saying? He's pointing out to the king that the only hope of straightening the differences is if every church in England had the same Bible. If we can't settle on one book, then we can't settle on any point of doctrine. Amen. One of the reasons why it's a hard time to get things settled of doctrine is because they said, well, this is what my Bible said. And there's so many differences that play on to what they believe on that we can't ever settle on doctrine, especially since we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved and rightly divide the word of truth. We have to base things off the Bible. And if we can't even agree on the Bible and there's so many differences, we can never agree on points of doctrine. So this is something they were trying to address back then. The suggestion eventually led to the translation of the authorized version. Now the king was a very astute politician. He may have laughed and jeered, but he said, hey, this is a kind of idea. I need to find some way to unify people, so let's do that. He recognized the need for a unifying translation for all of England to have. The great Bible was too cumbersome. Remember, that was a big, huge thing. The Geneva Bible was too controversial. Its notes, they're they're not going to stand for the notes. The Bishop's Bible was too careless and had too many mistakes. We can't use that. So the idea was, let's put a translation together that had no notes and just had the Bible and let people read the Bible for themselves. Great idea. So on June 22nd, 1604, the king announced that 54 men had been selected to translate the new Bible. The main qualification of these men were this, all right? You ready for the main qualification? What was the main thing that he was looking for? It wasn't doctrines. It wasn't professorships. It wasn't accolades. This was the requirement of these men. 2 Timothy 2.15, which said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the king said the main qualification is that they had taken pains in their private study of scripture. Amen. That's a good qualification. If you want someone to help translate correctly the Bible into your language, you want people who actually study the Bible. That helps. Who believe the Bible. Who read it for themselves. Wonderful. (laughs) So the work of translation was formally began in 1607. These earlier Bibles, remember we talked about the Tyndale Bible, Matthew's Bible, the Coverdale Bible. All of those Bibles previously were the work of one man. And whereas we appreciate the work that they did, there's so much uh, room for error. So the king wanted to set together a system for these learned men to make sure that the Bible that came out was exactly what the Bible said. And so he put together this system. He didn't want it to be from any one particular religious persuasion. The majority of the translators were split between Anglicans and Puritan systems, which re- resulted in checks and balances. Hey, 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 you want to that? No, 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 we're not going to let that fly. Thank you. Um, We're thankful for the checks and balances that it didn't end up leaning to one side or to the other. It was meant to be accurate and not just pull aside what someone believed. These 54 men were divided into six different companies and there were three different sites that were going to be used for this translation. So 54 was divided into six and then those six, two different companies in each one of those locations. Each company was responsible for translating a particular section of scripture and one of them was responsible for translating the Apocrypha. And we're going to go into detail, but basically each group was responsible for translating a certain section. When they were done, they would bring it to their other company that was still in the same school and they would look it over and make sure it was right. When they were done, they would take that to another school and they would look it over. And when they were done, they would take it to the other one. And everyone would have a turn looking at it and making sure that it was accurate. It went through many hands to make sure that it was correct. 
So let's go through here. And I passed out a handout to you before. These are the 15 general rules for the guidance of the authorized version. So this is, comes from King James himself. These are the rules that he said in order to make sure that we have the right translation. These are the rules that I want in place to make sure that the Bible is accurate. So let's go over these rules. First of all. The ordinary Bible read in the church, commonly called the Bishop's Bible, to be followed and as little altered as the truth of the original will permit. Basically, they had to pick a version to use as a basis. Let's start from there and then let's try to use that as the skeleton and then fix it as we go on. All right? Second of all, the names of the prophets and the holy writers with the other names in the text to be retained as nigh as it may be according as they were vulgarly used. Remember that word vulgar means common, as they were commonly used. Let's give an example. So <laughs> let's take Jeremiah. In the Old Testament, it calls him Jeremiah. and the New Testament, it calls him Jeremiah's. And so he says, just leave it that way. That's how people know it. In the Old Testament, it's this way. In the New Testament, this way. Let's not mess with it. Let's just keep it so what people are commonly call it. Let's not change names. Let's not mess with it. Let's just leave it as it is, as people know them. Then the old ecclesiastical words to be kept... Um, for example, the word church is not to be translated into congregation. Remember the word church in the New Testament is used 119 times. Let's not change the word church. People are used to that word. Let's not change it to congregation, even though it may have a similar meaning. People know what you mean by church. Let's do that. Let's keep terms that people are familiar with and are used to using. So if there are three or four words that could be used interchangeably, use the word that saved people are accustomed using. Now again, we don't, we're not trying to give a different Bible where people are trying to figure out what these new words are. Let's use the words that people are used to using. And now that's understanding that that word is the word that could be translated. We said if there are three or four words to use, use the one that people are used to using. Don't, don't develop something else. So they're supposed to stick to what they had as close as they could and still be true to the manuscript sources. Number four, when a word that hath diverse significations that are to be kept, which have been most commonly used by the most ancient fathers, being agreeable to the propriety of the place and to the analogy of the faith. Basically, it, when they would come across the word that could be translated with a Christian word or be translated with a sec, uh, secular word, let's use the Christian term for it. Let's try to keep it as... <clears throat> and again, this is just guidance because we don't want to start developing a new Bible that people just can't read when they start off and they have to learn terms and definitions. Let's use what we have. For example, you could translate a word deacon or you could translate... Wait, the word servant. Well, people have an idea of what a deacon is. So let's just keep it deacon because people know what it is, even though it does have the form of a servant. What is a deacon, by the way? It's a glorified grocery hauler. That's his job. <laughs> the deacon has a meaning that pertains to church life, so use that word. Number five, the division of the chapters to be altered either not at all or as little as may be if necessity be required. Now at this time, chapter and verse divisions had already been kind of set. Let's not rearrange chapter and verse divisions. We, uh, that's not our purpose of correcting it. We know that there are some places where chapter and verse divisions cut off right in the middle of a story and you go, wait, wait a second. How, or, or a sentence that gets cut off uh, by the way, the longest sentence inside of the ancient world is Ephesians chapter 1. It is the longest sentence in all of the English, and, but it's several verses long. It just got chopped up. All right, let's not mess with chapter and verses. Let's just worry about getting the text right, and we'll just use chapter and verses as people are used to using them, all right? And then no marginal notes at all to be affixed except for the explanation of a Greek or Hebrew word without some circumlocation so briefly and befitly expressed in the text. So they said, listen, no notes. Notes is what got us in trouble in the first place. No notes. Let's just have the text. And the only exception is that if you have a word that you have to explain how we got this word and why we use this word, then let's do that. For example, inside of the work, book of Job, they have the word kneesings. 
You're like, what in the world is sneezings? Well, it's a cross between breathing and sneezing. But they said, we don't have an English word that means the same thing. So, we're going to put sneezings. And then in the marginal notes, they tried to said, well, we didn't have a word for it. It's like breathing and sneezing. So, we just made up a word. That's fine. They could explain where they got it from. Okay? Sneezings. And so they said, no problem with that. Just no, no notes, no thing talking about your doctrine. But if you have to explain where this word, that's fine. All right? Such quotations of places to be marginally set down as serve for fit reference to one scripture to another. Now we said no marginal notes, but cross references, that's fine. If you want to talk about Jesus being the vine and then cross reference it to uh, Isaiah where God is setting up his vineyard, that's fine. That's fine. Just no doctoral notes, but cross references, that's fine. No problem. Then he said, every particular man of each company to take the same chapter or chapters, having been translated or amended to them severally by himself, where he thinketh good, all to meet together to confer what they done and agree for their parts what they shall stand. What does that mean? Basically, they said, when they're done, other people have to check your work. And everybody has to agree before we send it to publishing. Everybody has to agree that this is what it should be. Okay? That everyone examines. No one's sliding their work in. Everyone has to have their work checked. We're making sure checks and balances. We're making sure that it's done right. Any one company hath dispatched any one book in this manner, they shall send it to the rest and be considered of seriously and judiciously, for his majesty is very careful in this point. Basically, uh, once again, as I said, once the companies read it, they would pass it on to the other one. Then they would go to the other schools. They would check the work. And it was very important to the king that it was translated correctly. Make sure you check. When the work comes up to here, you remember when you were in class and you were told to switch papers and grade your papers and you were told to make sure that you grade it correctly? I mean, we used to threaten if you don't grade their paper correctly, we're taking it off your grade. Yeah. You know, <laughs> do it right. Make sure that it's right. And then, if any company upon review of the book so sent doubt or differ upon any place, to send them the word thereof, note the place and cite the reasons there, uh, to which if they could sit not, the difference be compounded in a meeting general, which is to be of the chief persons of each company at the end of the work. So basically, if I get something across my desk and I go, I don't think this is quite right. I'm supposed to write a note why I don't think it's right. Here's my reasonings. Here's my proof. And send it back to them. And then they go back, oh, you know what, that, that, you're right. They could change it. But if they go, eh, no, I'm pretty sure I'm right, what they would do is they would take it and they would do a comparison and someone would double check both of their work to make sure that it was correct and settle the argument, settle the thing, make sure it was right. When any place of special obscurity is doubted, letters to be directed by authority to send to any learned man in the land for his judgment in such a place. So here's this idea. If all 54 translators couldn't settle on how to translate a verse, they were to document in a letter all the manuscript evidence they had to work with, all the grammatical evidence, all their suggestions, and all of the reasons why they can't settle on this proper reading. And then they were to get it to any man in England who knew that passage outside of the 54 to, for them to investigate it. So what's going to happen is that it's not going to be just these 54, but other people are going to be allowed to check the work and to settle this and use their expertise. There may be someone who may be not a good translator, but he studied a certain passage. Maybe he's got a good insight on this. Let's use his intellect while we have it. Then letters are to be sent from every bishop to the rest of his clergy, admonishing them of this translation in hand, and to move and charge as many skillful in the tongues, having taken pains in that kind, to send his particular observations to the company, whether at Westminster, Cambridge, or Oxford. So basically, what the preachers were supposed to do was the pastors were supposed to send out and find out if anybody had done extensive study in Hebrew or Greek, and believes that he has a proper and more accurate rendering to the passage, they were supposed to encourage that man to send his work to the translators and use and put that as consideration. So let's say that I had a personal interest in the gospel record of Luke. 
And I had spent time studying it in the Greek and digging into it and whatnot. And then I hear, hey, they're translating things. And I may not be the best translator, but I spent a lot of time in Luke. I may have some good notes and some good ideas to send to them. And they go, oh man, this is really good. Okay, that helps. And so what they do is they have a call out to all of England that if anybody's done particular study, send in your notes and we'll look at it. So again, this isn't just meant to be just a couple of people trying to get their opinion. This was a great work to make sure it was accurate and that no intellect was to be ignored. 13, the directors in each company to be the deans of Westminster, Chester, and that place. The king's professors in Hebrew or Greek of authority. All right, what does that mean? <coughs> Sorry. So the directors of the company, <coughs> it's giving them the directions of who's going to be in charge, who's going to be overseeing, who's going to be accountable for these things. Verse 14, or <laughs> number 14, the translations to be used when they agree better with a text than the bishops. Tyndale's, Matthew's, Coverdale's, White Churches, or Geneva. What are they saying here? They're saying, listen, these are the authorized books you could look to. And if they say it better, use that. You could use Tyndale's. You could use Matthew's. You could use Coverdale's. You could do White Churches in Geneva. But do not use any of the wrong text. Don't go back to the Latin. Don't use the Vulgate. Don't use the Reims D.A. Don't use the corrupt text. These are the only approved ones. The ones that came from the good source. Don't use these other texts text. That's pretty clear, isn't it? We, we want the right accurate text. We don't want to get messing with the corrupt text. And then, besides that, said directors before mentioned, three or four of the most ancient grave divines, either of the universities not employed in translating, to be assigned by vice chancellor upon the conference, with the rest of the heads to be overseers of the translations, as well as Hebrew as Greek, for better observation of the fourth rule specified above. What does this happen? Well, what happens is that they're supposed to go find history professors who had studied the ancient writers and learned from them. Find the professors who work in the universities, who know church histories, and who knows the writing of the church fathers, and allow them to pull out the historical positions of the men who were true to God's word and true to sound doctrine, and look and see what they had said about the passage. To go back to history, find the people who believe the Bible, and see what they said about a passage to make sure we're getting it correct. Go back to the ancient sources, make sure that it's not changing meaning over time. Let's go back to the source and figure out what did they say this meant, and make sure we get the correct thing. That's a lot of studying, by the way. Trying to make sure that we got the correct Bible. These rules were meant to develop as accurate as of a translation as one could possibly get. Now, when one company finished its work, it was reviewed within the company. Then it was sent each and every other company to be reviewed and reviewed again and altered if necessary. Then the learned men from all of the empire were invited to come and review the work. So, hey, we have finished this translation. Why don't you come take a look and make sure that it agrees that it's accurate with the text. So, no good intellect in the land was to be ignored. They were to use everyone to make sure that it was the correct text. After the translation it was completed, it was reviewed by any qualified man within the kingdom. It was then reviewed again by a final board of six of the original translators. They said, all right, let's double check, make sure we do it one last check. Then they sent it to the printers. After it had been checked, approved, checked, approved, checked, approved, final approved, sent. Again, all of it, a big, long process to make sure the Bible was as accurate as possible to the text. The materials available to the King James translators were both Greek and Hebrew witnesses, the text of Erasmus, Abizas, and Stephanus. They had the ancient versions in Latin and Syrian and called in the Dutch, French, Spanish, and Italian versions basically to do a comparison and double check their work to make sure that they had done it correctly. There had never been to this day an undertaking of this size and scope. And again, we're thankful that God put it together for the purpose of making sure we had the most accurate version we possibly can have. 
Because it was valued as a history book rather than the Word of God, the Apocrypha was included in between the Testaments. Now, the Apocrypha is not Scripture, but it was history. We have the book of Maccabees that explains what happened to the Jewish people in between the Testaments. It's good history, but it wasn't considered a Bible, but they included it anyways. Now, the one big drawback with the original authorized version is they went back to the Gothic type rather than the Roman type, meaning that you had to look and stare at it to make sure that it said it right. The S's looked like F's and it was just all weird looking uh, where they go back and change it later on. Now the Bibles came off the presses at Oxford and Cambridge in 1611. The group ended up with just 46 translators instead of the 54 that was originally chosen. The Westminster group, they were in charge of translating Genesis to 2 Kings and Romans to Jude. The Cambridge group translated 1 Chronicles to Ecclesiastes and the Apocrypha. The Oxford group translated Isaiah to Malachi and the Gospels, Acts, and the book of Revelation. Just for your interest of who did what. The training and the learning of the men that translated the Bible are the best of the time. And we're not going to go into all of them, but if there's many books on the, translate, uh, the lives of the translators of the authorized version that you could study their lives and see what kind of men they were. They were people who knew languages. For example, one of the translators was Lancelot Andrews. He studied at Cambridge. He majored in Eastern languages and divinity. As a child, he was totally addicted to study. My kind of guy. He was one of those kids that his mom had to kick him out and make him play outside because otherwise he'd just stay and read books. Lancelot Andrews learned a new language each year during his one month Easter vacation with his parents. He was someone who definitely understood languages and how it worked. That's just an example of one of the lives. So these guys weren't people who goes, oh, I don't know. They knew languages. They were the top of the field. They were the top of anything that could be given. And by the way, the English language was at its height and at its zenith in power, language, and structure. We've kind of gone downhill from then as we can listen to most of us talk like we ain't going to do that no more. It was at the prime and the zenith of its language. So then we come to revisions. Some people will say, well, did you know that your authorized version went through revisions? Okay, well, let's try to explain revisions that happened within the Bible. Now, first of all, there were some problems in different printings of the Bible down through the years. Obviously, they were typographical errors and not translation. Meaning, remember, they had to set up the print backwards and upside down of the little letters and put them together. And there was some printing errors that came through in the first copies. For example, in Exodus uh, 38.10, the hoops was there. It should have been hooks. So instead of using the hooks, you had hoops. Leviticus 13.15, plain, it should have been plague. So instead of saying plague, they said he had the play. Okay. Matthew 16.25, his is used twice. So they put two his's instead of one. And Psalm 69.32, seek good should have been seek God. Oops, made a mistake. Um, chief rulers was changed to chief ruler, singular. Isaiah 13.8, a woman that traveleth should have been a woman that travaileth. Even though it's probably a lot of ladies who think that um, traveling is travailing. But Ezekiel 14.8, daughter changed to daughters. Now, see, these aren't doctoral things. These are things that a printer messed up on. No big deal. But they had to have a revision to fix these. So these aren't changing words and they're not changing doctrines. They're just having a revision to fix some of the spelling errors. There was no set spelling until later. In fact, it wasn't until Noah Webster in America in the 1800s that came up with standardized spelling. Before then, there was no rules. You can never fail a spelling test because you just used whatever you wanted. It was wonderful, but it made it hard to read, especially when the different spellings of, different, of the same word were different all throughout the book. So they had to have a revision to standardized spelling. Well, you know your King James Bible has thousands of revisions. Yes, someone updated spelling. Praise the Lord. I'm glad that we could spell the same word. It's wonderful. <laughs> so there was a revision to change the Gothic text to a Roman text. Meaning we have a Bible that we could read instead of art. <laughs> 
Then you had um, different printing errors that happened. This is more for the funny ha-has because over time people try to print out the Bible and what happened, they made a mistake. Now the wonderful thing is because people are so familiar with the Bible, they point them out. They find them immediately. I know because I put together a chronological Bible and we're missing part of a verse and I got butchered. I got hate my I thought you loved the word of God. How can you butcher? It was a mistake, man. It wasn't purposeful. I didn't hate the verse. It just it happens. They catch it quickly. And that's what happened just so you know. In 1641, you had the More C Bible. In Revelation 21, they forgot to add the word no. So instead of no more C, it said more C. In 15, uh, 1653, we had the unrighteous Bible. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, the unrighteous shall inherit the earth, uh, kingdom of God. <coughs> it should have been the righteous inheritance. In 16, uh, 1701, Psalm 119, 161, instead of princes persecuted me without the cause, the Bible defended itself and said printers had persecuted me without a cause. <laughs> In 1611, or 1711, you had the prophet Bible. In Isaiah 57, 12, it says, They shall profit thee instead of not profit thee. In 1716, uh, you had the sin on Bible. In John 15, or 5, 14, instead of sin no more, someone switched the letters and said, sin on more. Just print an error and it happens. In 1717, you have the Vinegar Bible. A chapter heading should have said the parable of the vineyard. Instead, it said the parable of the vinegar. The tongue stinging Bible, Mark 735. It should have said that Jesus loosed the string of his tongue. Instead, it said it loosed the sting of his tongue. <coughs> In 1792, you had Philip denying Christ rather than Peter denying Christ. The Murderer's Bible, Mark 727. Now again, printing errors happen. So instead of saying, let the children first be filled, it said, let your children first be killed. <laughs> then we have the Murderer's Bible too. Jude 16 said murderers instead of murmurers. 1802, 1 Timothy 5.21, instead of Paul saying, I charge thee, he said, I discharge thee. You're fired. 1804, it's instead of saying, out of my loins, it said, out of my lions. <laughs> then you have the standing fishes Bible. Ezekiel 47.10, instead of saying fishers standing on it, it said you have fishes standing upon it. That'd be better fishing, right? If they're just standing there waiting for you to grab it. In uh, 17, or 1807, instead of saying he that, hear, that has ears to hear, it said he that has ears to ear. <laughs> then it also said in that same Bible, placemakers instead of peacemakers. It happens. In 1810, you have the wife haters Bible. In Luke 14, 26, instead of a man hate his own life also, it came out that a man hate not his own wife also. Well, some people might agree with that. But... In 1823, you had Genesis 24, 61. Rebecca arose and her damsels. They somehow made it say, and Rebecca arose and her camels. Could be the same thing. So when this Bible came off the press, its superiority, superiority was noticed. When the Bible came out, people said, that's a good Bible. They flocked to grab it. It quickly became the Bible the people wanted to have. Now, except for a small scattering of groups, this Bible has stood against defectors all the way from 1611 to 1952 that it was not touched by anyone. It was considered the authorized version. It was the Bible that people used. Now, going back to our text, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Again, we're going to stand before God one day and we're going to have to give an account. And we're going to give an account based off of what the Bible said. And it's up to us to make sure that we're getting what the Bible says and discerning it correctly, to study, to show ourselves to prove. Because when it's all said and done, you can't say, well, our church believe this. 
it will not stand before God. When you stand before God, you can't say, well, my pastor believed this. That won't stand before God. You're going to stand before God based off of what the Bible said and be judged for yourself what the Bible said. So this is a big deal to make sure that we start off with the correct version that comes from the correct text that did not come from a corrupt text and then make sure that we can study to show ourselves approved unto God. This is a big deal. And we're thankful for the history and the documentation and the pains that they took to make sure that the Bible that we had was as accurate as humanly possible to the correct text. Now we also believe that God made a promise to preserve his word. And so whereas man did his best to make sure that it was humanly possible. Because of God's preservation. He used man as human instrumentality. To make sure that the Bible that we have in our hand. Is indeed the very word of God. That he intended us to have. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.